We are so fortunate and lucky today to have Richard Schlemiskis, which I'm going to refer to, Richard, your your other name, which is Richard Smith, because it's easier to pronounce, if that's okay <laughs> with you. And so, you know, we, we call you the magical composer from Wisconsin. So the first question I have for you is uh, something that you and I have discussed. And, you know, I got an email from you recently, um, and that is, tell us how you got into this composition framework. I mean, how did you begin um, getting interested in composing music? Because it goes back to your childhood, and I think that's very interesting. Yeah, it really does, because uh, what I first got interested in music, it was but through playing the piano. My sister played the piano at home, and I liked what I heard, and she played a lot of Mozart. And so I decided at a very young age, when I was three years old, that I wanted to play Mozart too. And so after she would finish playing, I'd sit down at the piano and try my best. And my mother finally said to her, you know, Marion, you should really teach Richard how to play the piano. And my sister said, well, that's not so easy for a three-year-old. He can't even read words yet. <laughs> so somehow she invented some way of making it so that I was actually able to read music off of the printed page when I was three and a half years old. That's amazing what she was able to do. It was more, the next step was to actually write like Mozart, right? <laughs> and so I wanted to write pieces of music too. And so I eventually got down to that when I was seven years old. That's how it and, started. And, and you know, didn't you also do things um, like in uh, high school? And I mean, this career didn't start before you uh, um, uh, I mean, your career really began when you were older, but, um, didn't you have some sort of, um, musical ability and function, uh, when you were in high school? Well, yeah, I, I always say that my musical career began in kindergarten because, uh, when I was in kindergarten, the teacher saw that I could play the piano. So I was asked to play the Star Spangled Banner for the assembly at school which was kindergarten through sixth grade. And I was really scared, but I, I played it. And uh, so that was my first exposure to an audience. So I really wasn't so scared in terms of playing in front of other people. And I know that that can be a major deal for a lot of people. They may know how to play, but they don't want to play for other people. Uh, they're afraid of making mistakes and stuff like that. My sister was kind of like that. But it didn't bother me, and I enjoyed the reaction that I got. And when I was in high school, yeah, I was in the orchestra, and I did play piano in the orchestra. I kind of fumbled my way through the clarinet for a little while, and then they put me on percussion, so I got familiar with that too. But eventually it always came back to the piano. And in my senior year, I played uh, uh, Mozart's Piano Concerto in B-flat major as part of the uh, concert in senior year. Okay, you know, uh, you've now mentioned Mozart twice, so I have to ask you this question. Is is the film Amadeus, does it have any reality in it? I mean, is there, is there or is it just fictional? Well, I, I don't really know the answer to that question. I know that Mozart was a very talented composer and that Salieri was very envious of what Mozart could do. But uh, I think there's a lot of fiction in there, but it makes for good theater. Oh, it certainly does. Okay, let's go back to you. So um, where did you get your formal training? Um, you know, um, and I mentioned formal training because, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about college or graduate school, et cetera. Right. So uh, my formal training, well, I took piano lessons for a very long time. And then that was through high school. And then after that, when I was in college, I took uh, summer school classes. And I took them at Columbia University. And I took courses in harmony and uh, counterpoint. And then when I graduated from Fordham and went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, I took uh, more classes in composition. But um, like I was telling you before, uh, I, I really feel that in terms of the best teachers that I had were the music that I listened to and the stories that I heard from other people. Well, so now that, that begs the question. So who did you listen to and how did they influence you? 
Okay, so Mozart, <laughs> and then of course I played the sonatas of Beethoven, which were very, very challenging, and Bach uh, meant a lot to me, and Bach was very difficult and very challenging, but very worthwhile. And uh, I was not afraid of making mistakes uh, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was playing, and I wanted to imitate those styles. So I began writing little fugues, and I began writing little sonatas. And uh, then when I was in high school, I became involved in a band besides the orchestra, and we played different music. We played uh, music that was rock music. And when I got into college, I joined a rock band. And uh, then after that, when I uh, actually started teaching in the early days, I got a job as a, a band on the road. I left teaching for a couple of years to pursue a full-time career as a composer and as a musician, and I was writing all kinds of different styles of music, rock and country music and all that stuff, but really, basically, down there deep inside me was my love for classical music. So Bach, Beethoven, uh, Mozart, Tchaikovsky I loved, uh, I loved Stravinsky, Shostakovich, the Russians, uh, I liked uh, Grieg, the Romantic composers, which actually leads to a to a wonderful story about mistakes. Uh, at, at Juilliard School of Music, there was a very very famous uh, teacher, and her name was Rosina Levine, and she was no small deal. She was born in the Ukraine, actually. They, their family lived in Kiev, and they were Jewish. And she was also had Dutch heritage, and she came to be a teacher at the Juilliard School of Music. And I knew people at Fordham who actually had friends at the Juilliard. And so when I, I went over to that school and I talked to different people and they told me a, a story about her, about how she had wanted to enrich this one piano student uh, who she was having trouble with interpreting music correctly. And uh, she uh, told him that Arthur Rubinstein, the famous pianist, was giving a concert of three romantic concertos all in one evening. Grieg and Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. This was a concert that she was going to attend, and she told the student to do it. And the student went to the concert, and so did she. And at the next lesson, she asked him what he thought of the concert. And he said, you know, the thing that surprised me the most was how many mistakes Rubinstein made, especially in the Grieg concerto and in the Tchaikovsky concerto. I just couldn't believe it. And Rosina Levine said to him, so you heard him play, but you didn't listen to the music. And that had a really big impact on me. And so it, when, when I play, I try to put my heart and soul into it, and I'm not concentrating on making mistakes. And I do a lot of improv improvisation at the piano. And uh, at the same time as I was teaching, I also got a job as a church musician here in West Bend. And I was a church musician for 30 years. And what I would play, a lot of the times I would improvise uh, during communion or, or during a, a presentation of the gifts or like that. And people would come up to me and they would ask me what I had played. And I said, well, I played what was going through my mind at that time, which was a combination of a whole lot of different things. Did you, as a church musician, did you, was it prescribed or were you um, working from your own, um, um, were you working from your own music? Well, that's kind of half and half. We, I, I, I was the one who chose the music that was being played. And I chose a lot of music which had been written and published. And much of the music that I did actually do was written by me. And some of it was published uh, by Oregon Celtic Press and Trinity Music, they published some of the pieces that I did. And um, so it's a combination, Carl, of both. Did you, uh, you know, I've always, you know, often when I go into churches, and of course, um, um, uh, I will go often around Christmas time, and of course, they're always playing Handel. And I'm wondering if Handel was the person that you went to in your own church music. Uh, we did handle at Christmas time, yes, and also at Easter time, it, because it's very, very famous and very beautiful music. Yeah, 
and uh and it was important <laughs> and uh yeah, again he's a composer from that period which is one of my favorite periods of music and that's what i kind of that's my comfort music and i think that the thing that's the most important to me about music is that uh, I didn't get bogged down with making mistakes and that I continued to write even though my orchestral music that I was writing was really not being performed at that time. But I still had my musical diary and I took notes every day and I played every day. And playing was my strongest suit and improvisation at the piano in church was very, very strong for me. But... Uh, Music is something which is something that's been so much a part of my life. I, I wouldn't think of not being with it. And having that diary really helped me stay connected with music all the time and with composition. Okay, I you know, you mentioned something about your youth, and I have to ask you this. So when you were young and playing rock and roll and enjoying rock and roll, who did you who did you like and who did you admire in the rock and roll field? And well then we'll go back to classical music. Yeah, well, the the musicians that would that I thought were the greatest were the Beatles. I thought they were great. In fact, uh, you know, even today I think of uh, you know Jake Shimamakuro, who plays the ukulele. Uh, when I was in uh, in Honolulu one time, I was in uh, the park. Uh, what what is uh, Queen Kapiolani? Uh, yeah, the Papillotti Park, right there, <laughs> and uh, they have a shell there. And Jake Shimabukuro was actually giving a, a free concert, and you could hear the music, and I, and I was drawn to it. I went over to it, and uh, he was playing "While My Guitar Gently Weeps" uh, by George Harrison, and what he did with it was so magnificent because he took that music and he improvised on it. And he put his soul into it. And that's one of the wonderful things about classical music or even about good rock music based on classical traditions. After all, they did Eleanor Rigby for a string quartet and the vocals. So I, I, that, that's, it's so rich to me. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Well, it's interesting that you pick the Beatles because the Beatles have been adapted um, you know, often by, by uh, classical musicians. Yes, um, and it's. Um, I'm not sure it's because of the melodies or, you know, why uh, the Beatles, but it's you know classical music, much less department stores and um and yeah. uh, and grocery stores and things like that. So, okay, let's get down to the nitty gritty. And so you had mentioned to me that you love to come to Hawaii and to the Hawaiian right. Islands, mm -hmm. um, to compose. So yeah. let's hear why. Why? Why Hawaii? Well, uh. <laughs> that, well, the way it is, uh, I became so attached to Hawaii uh, after I was teaching in those summer schools that I was at at Kuraho, and I came to just love the people, and I really love the place. Uh, my time for composing is in the morning. In the morning, it's always very, very peaceful, and you can hear the birds, and it just, it, it just allows my mind to be free to think, and when I would go to the beach, I wanted to go to the beach every day. I just love the ocean. What I would do is I would go into the ocean, and I'd stay there for maybe 45 minutes, an hour, more than that, and I got caught up in listening to the to the waves, just the sound of the waves, there are, there are cadences and there are crescendos and there are decrescendos and it just would make different ideas come into my mind that I could then put into place the next day. It, it just is very fruitful for me. That's the effect that Hawaii has on me and why I, I like to work in Hawaii. In fact, I've done several orchestral works all in Hawaii in the times that I've been there. Um, do you th did you you mentioned the birds, and so do the birds come into your music also? I mean, do you sure. get inspired by them? 
Well, there is actually a French composer who did put words into his music, Olivier Messiaen. He was a French composer, and he tried to mimic the different bird calls. And that, to me, is not really possible. That They have a music of their own. And every once in a while, it will trigger something different in me, a different thought in me. It's it's more the peace that I feel and the net, the sounds of nature that I feel that give me ideas when I am in Hawaii. If you had to pick um, three of your compositions that um, you have found um, to resonate with you over the years, um, and maybe perhaps not over the years, perhaps uh, currently, um, could you name the pieces and talk a little bit about um, each piece and um, and what the music sounds like? I, unfortunately, we don't have a piano. I wish I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, that would be even better. But yeah, uh, your description would be great. Yeah. Well, uh, the first piece that was performed by an orchestra, which was the Milwaukee Chamber Symphony Orchestra in Milwaukee uh, at the Performing Arts Center, was in three movements, and it was called... Um, on a country road, and they were written at different, about different locations. The first location was a place called Wading River, New York, which is on Long Island, which I, even though I was born in New York City in Brooklyn, I grew up really on the island in a place called, very small community called Wading River. And um, it was a piece that I wrote actually when I was in high school. And uh, is it's very peaceful and it's it's very happy in fact music is kind of an escape for me and a lot of my music would probably be considered to be very upbeat and very joyous both from a religious point of view from our religious music that i do and also from uh, a secular point of view for the music that i've written for orchestra not religious the second movement was written at a very turbulent time period in U.S. history. It was written in 1968, which was the time in UW-Madison that there were the riots against the Vietnam War. And that's one of the most turbulent, dissonant pieces of music that I've written. And uh, the third movement is from uh, St. Croix Falls, and that is in Minnesota, and it's a river, and it's just very peaceful and kind of uh, grand because I'm trying to depict musically the feeling of the awesome power of that water in the music that, I, that I'm writing. So that, that piece was performed and it was well received. So that's one which has a big dent on me. <laughs> and then a second piece of music that I wrote would be Times Four. And Times 4 was written in a, a difficult period of my life. Um, my sister, unfortunately, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And I ended up having to take care of her. She was older than me, and she's the one who taught me how to play the piano. I had to take care of her. Of course. And so uh, I, it was hard because the disease caused a change in her personality. And from being a very loving and warm and generous person, she became a very cold and angry person. And she would shout and scream at me. It was very hard, Carl, very, very hard. And uh, I empathize with people who have loved ones who have Alzheimer's disease. And music was my escape. And so that piece times four was in four movements. It was morning afternoon, evening, and night. And uh, morning I wrote, all, in fact, all of the movements that I wrote were fully orchestrated in Hawaii. However, I did write the movements for them for afternoon and for evening in uh, New York where I was taking care of her. But morning was written entirely in Hawaii, and night was written entirely in Hawaii. And uh, it made a big dent on me. And that 
has been performed actually that was performed by a couple of different high school orchestras in michigan and in north carolina and then also in ohio and then the last piece was the one that's going to be performed at calvin university in uh, michigan uh april 22nd i think is the date of that concert i know that i got to go to a rehearsal next week because uh, the, the perk is called 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, and it's based on the poem by Wallace Stevens. And his poetry is very musical in nature, and I couldn't possibly set his text to a, a musical melody. So I'm the narrator, and I read a stanza of the poem, and then I give my musical ideas about what this music inspires me to think of. Uh, Stevens felt that imagination was the most important human quality and which differentiates us truly from the rest of the animals, that we can imagine things that are not and are yet to be and can become. And that really strikes a chord with me, no pun intended, Carl. And uh, I, but, but, but pine ball taken. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, I set the thirteen uh, stanzas to to music, and I'm so looking forward to doing that with the orchestra. I said uh, to the conductor, who has been an advocate for my music, Josh Saller, I said he could either have uh, me, or if he could possibly get Patrick Stewart, I would prefer him to have Patrick Stewart. But he said I was cheaper, so I guess I'm doing it. Wow, big name. Uh, <laughs> let me let me let me ask you this because you mentioned um, your compositions in Hawaii. Yeah, um, are they affected besides um, you know the uh, um, the waves and uh, melodic um, um, composition and perhaps crashing sounds of waves? Are they influenced at all by Hawaiian music and the melodies of Hawaiian music? And uh, you, you mentioned um, you know um, the ukulele. Yeah. Well, all of these things obviously have an influence, but I, I, I have not been tempted to write in a Hawaiian style because that belongs to the people of Hawaii, and I have to sift things through my lens, through my own background, and through my understanding, and I enjoy listening very much to Hawaiian music. I love Music. I'm taking an anthropology course actually right now, and and it's about uh, Native Americans and uh, the music that they have, which was shunned actually in the beginning by the Europeans and is now being recognized by Americans as having such worth. I think that we have to recognize all the different gifts that people have to offer. So. No, I have not tried to. If the influence has been there, it's subtle and it's not conscious on my part. But maybe there is a little bit of Hawaiian influence in the music that I've written too. That's great. Well, you know, uh, that's wonderful, and it's wonderful that you come here and compose. Um, you know, um, you had mentioned that um, um, this piece that you're going to that the um, conductor um, was the person who you know, is a big supporter of yours. Is that how your music gets performed? Does a, a conductor find out about it? Or how is your music disseminated? Um, uh, because that's a, that's kind of a um, uh, uh, um, an interesting question for anyone who is going to compose music. Yeah, well, it helps to go to a good, to a famous school. It would have helped if I had gone to Juilliard School of Music, because uh, then that leads to inns where you get to meet different people. So in, in the music that I have done, I've kind of been at the ha in the hands of the people who have been around me. And the Josh Seller was one of them. He taught at the high school where I was working, and he became interested in the music that I had written. And I've, I've, I've dealt with so many musicians over the years that I was working at church in terms of uh, instrumentalists, and especially with singers, 
but these are not people who are really in positions to promote live music elsewhere. So I guess it's a matter of contacting people who are getting your music published in that manner. And I've written a lot of music and dedicated it to different people. And now I think some people are beginning to get back to me and saying they would like to hear more. Um, for example, let me ask you for a specific example for your, the Milwaukee um, Chamber Group. Yes. How did, you, how did that come about? Well, that came about because we were regular attendees at the, uh, at the concert series. And my wife, Cheryl, <laughs> wrote down when they <laughs> on one of these uh, uh, things that they gave, asking for recommendations for pieces that they could play in the future. She said, why don't you play the works of my husband? <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, actually the, one of the directors contacted me and said, could you please submit some music to us? And I did, and it was performed. Well, that's, you know, so, you know, the answer there is your wonderful wife promoted you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Now, I know you have children, and yes. so do your children also, um, are they musicians also, and have they copied dad? No, the oldest one has not, but, you know, that's interesting you should st say that, Carl, because uh, after all these years when he kind of didn't, do anything with the piano he had learned to play the piano he's now taking it up again it's so important the music is just it's, it's so much a part of our lives really um that leads me to another thing when i was teaching european history i used to ask in the beginning the question what are the five most important things that europeans did for the world and then I would follow that up with, and what are the five worst things that the Europeans did for the world? And uh, one of the things that was never mentioned, really, on best things was music. They would talk about medicine, and they would talk about science, and yet music so much touches our lives on a daily basis. I think it's just because it's so much a part of us, we, we don't think about really where it came from. Anyway, um, I think you were asking me a different question, Carl. What is the question that you were asking me? Well, I was I was asking about your son, about what oh, yeah, they play music. Michael, yeah, Michael plays the guitar, and uh, he plays the guitar on a daily basis. He did learn how to play the piano, but he has really followed up with the guitar as his primary instrument. Well, um, we are running out of time, and oh, um, right. um, and um. Rich, I want to thank you for your wonderful discussion of um, what it means to be a composer. And of course, our last queen was a composer, um, Lilio Kalani. And so um, you fit into um, a mold uh, that is well represented here in Hawaii. And uh, well, um, and you mentioned European history and um, history in general. And of course, you follow in that great um, tradition of um, composers. I'm going to leave the last words to you. If there's any brief words of advice that you would give, especially young people, if they want to compose music, what would that be? Stick to it. Keep a musical diary. Write every day. It's important that you keep writing every day. And don't let anybody discourage you if you have a love for it. Just keep on plugging away. Well, there it is, and, you know, uh, we, we call him the magical composer from Wisconsin, Rich Smith, and a hui ho and aloha to you, uh, Rich Thank Smith. You. to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com.
Thanks so much. Aloha.